research associate at Geometry Research, and uh, we work closely with the team from Scroll. So today I'm going to talk about um, a really important primitive in zero knowledge proofs called lookup arguments. Um, and we're going to look at a few examples from the zero knowledge proof system Halo 2. Um, and this is the proof system that's used by Scroll. So if you're not familiar with zero knowledge proofs, um, and scroll and look up arguments, um, don't worry, because that's the first thing we're going to go over. So zero knowledge proofs are interesting for Ethereum in many ways. And one of them is in scaling via ZK rollups. Um, and the idea of ZK rollups is that we can move um, expensive execution of transactions off to layer two um, and not have to pay for the gas on layer one. Um, but to ensure that this executions were done correctly, um, we want to submit some kind of short proof back to layer one. Um, and basically, what Scroll and other ZK EVM rollups have done is to encode the whole Ethereum virtual machine state transition function inside of a zero knowledge proof. Um, and the nice thing about these proofs, they're called ZK snarks, um, is that even though the computation um, that they perform is uh, can be arbitrarily complex. Verifying that the computation was done correctly is cheap. Um, so on layer one, we only need to do a very short check um, of the correctness of the computation. So scroll is an example of this ZK EVM. And the underlying proof system that they use to generate this proof is called Halo 2. So representing a complicated state machine inside um, zero knowledge proof is not easy at all. Um, and very often, so this, this succinctness property um, of the final proof comes at a cost of um, basically uh, more computation, more processing done by the prover. So these um, state transition functions um, have to be represented in a way um, that is um, efficient for the prover uh, to compute. So this is where lookup arguments come in. Um, and lookup arguments are a primitive that has been um, gaining lots of attention in the zero knowledge proof world um, because um, of this, this idea, the lookup singularity um, proposed in 2022 by Barry Whitehat. So the lookup singularity is, was inspired by the need to represent some very complex functions in an efficient way. So for example, um, um, most of these proof systems work over cryptographic objects called elliptic curves. Um, and they have to deal with very large finite fields. And certain operations are efficient in this setting. But certain operations such as bit shifts or any Boolean operations are inefficient. And um, instead of paying the overhead of um, converting these um, bitwise um, Boolean functions into a very unnatural finite field setting, what we can do is simply pre-compute um, the results 
of the Boolean operations and look them up in a table. So the idea of lookup singularity is precisely this, that um, instead of trying to arithmetize um, inefficient um, and non-arithmetic functions, we pre-compute tables mapping their inputs to their output. And every time we need to perform one of these functions in the circuit, we simply do a single lookup into the table. So this lookup singularity inspired um, a line of research into lookup arguments. Um, and a recent example is Jolt. So um, Jolt is a, it's a zero knowledge virtual machine. So it's not a zero knowledge EVM but a more general uh, RISC-V, it targets the RISC-V instruction set. Um, so in Jolt, instead of natively arithmetizing the virtual machine's functions, um, they, they indeed replace each instruction with a lookup into a pre-computed table. Um, and so, most of their virtual machine in the circuit consists of lookups. They also have a memory checking argument. Um, and for those operations that they couldn't efficiently represent in lookups, they have R1CS, um, simple constraint system. So we've already mentioned the most um, common use case for lookups, which is um, to represent um, non-arithmetic or non-linear functions um, um, efficiently. So we mentioned bitwise operations. Another common use case is range checks to check that a certain element is less than, let's say, um, 18 bits. Um, so most um, most of the RISC-V instructions, for example, um, also have the nice property of being decomposable in the sense that um, you can break a large lookup table into several smaller ones and combine the results of these small lookups back into a single result. Um, there are also certain um, lookup arguments, uh, sorry, there are also certain functions that are not as decomposable. So um, I call these monolithic um, and they don't break down as nicely um, into smaller tables. So um, both of these um, are fixed lookups in the sense that we can pre-compute um, the whole table um, offline in the pre-processing phase. And in other words, uh, the prover doesn't need to pay the cost um, of computing the table. Um, so this is very efficient um, in, in settings where proving time, um, where, where, where proving time is, basically um, a bottleneck. Um, whereas there are some lookups as well um, that are dynamic, which means that the prover is actually constructing the table on the fly. And so we're not able to rely on the pre-processing stage um, to compute the table. Um, so for example, um, the, the scroll ZK EVM constructs um, two reordered versions of the memory accesses in, in the ZK EVM. Um, and because for each invocation of the ZK EVM, we're gonna access different locations in the memory with different values. So there's no way to pre-compute th this table. Um, 
So some, I, I, I think a very new paper um, in, the, in the recursive setting, um, for lookups in the recursive setting has just come out. Um, and that's interesting because it, it could give us a version of dynamic lookups that are also decomposable in a way. Um, so if, if you're not familiar with the recursive setting for zero knowledge proofs, a high level intuition is that um, recursion can be used to break up a very large circuit into many smaller repetitions. So um, in, in the case of um, the virtual machine, for example, uh, each repetition could just be a single instruction. And um, yeah, this reduces space complexity for the prover. Um, and it, it basically amortizes the, the verifier cost as well um, over the number of steps of recursion. So yeah, like we said, a virtual machine, um, for example, could do one step per, per recursion. Um, and rec the recursive setting is also interesting in uh, non-blockchain use cases. For example, verifiable computation of, you know, large language models or neural network. Um, so in this context, um, wait, a, a lookup argument um, in the recursive setting um, you could think of each recursive step as like one lookup argument. So one access of the lookup table. Um, so in, in a different sense, it's decomposable um, because you're only paying for um, your, your, you're only paying for the locations that you access in that recursive step. By the way, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. So um, please um, alert me when I have, say, five minutes left. Um, so what's interesting about most of these use cases is that the table of size n is much larger um, than the input, which means that in, in most cases, we are not accessing every value in the lookup table. And we're accessing only um, the inputs that are relevant to us. Um, so I've put here basically what I think is state of the art in each of these quadrants. Um, and this is my opinion. This classification, as well as this, um, these protocols, are my opinion. Um, and in fact, there's been really a lot of work in lookups um, since 2022 and, yeah, into 2023 and this year as well. Um, and we're going to do a short overview of a few of these lookup arguments. So I've selected those that have implementations in Halo 2. Uh, once again, Halo 2 is the proof system that Scroll uses. Um, so, but let's look over the timeline, roughly speaking, um, before so Calc Plus over here was a seminal paper. Before Calc Plus, um, we only had lookup arguments um, that were O-N for the prover. In other words, um, the prover always had to process the whole table. But after Calc Plus, we had um, a lookup argument that was independent in the size of the table. So the prover only had to pay OM squared, and M here is the number of inputs. So 
Yeah, in the case where the table is much larger than the inputs, um, this produces lots of savings. Um, sorry, did someone say something? Okay, so, um, and these savings come from exploiting um, pre-computation um, and having basically a lot of the expensive computation offloaded to the pre-processing stage. Um, so pre-processing, once again, is only possible if your tables are fixed. So if you know the table ahead of time, uh, you can prepare lots of um, just helpful values for the prover to use at prov proving time. <clears throat> Whereas this latest um, proofs for deep thought paper that came out this year um, uh, adapts this to the recursive setting such that at each recursive step, the prover only has to pay um, OM and M is the number of inputs once again. Um, yeah, and they say this works for fixed or dynamic, so it doesn't rely on pre-processing. But once again, this is only in the recursive setting. So um, this table here is a little outdated. It was adapted from um, this 2022 paper, um, and it's showing yeah, basically, um, so note that from calc to calc plus, we get um, this dependence on n, the size of the table disappears. And then from then on, um, the prover only needs to pay for um, the inputs that they're using. And these are all for fixed tables. Um, so. Beyond that, um, I have to update this benchmark table, um, but benchmarking these lookup arguments is tricky because as we saw before, they are different arguments are optimized for different use cases. Um, but we'll go into benchmarks a little later on. Um, how am I doing on time? Can someone actually tell me? Thirteen minutes left. Okay, great. So um, I think with the remaining thirteen minutes, um, we'll go over these four lookup arguments um, at a very high level, um, and then we'll end off with benchmarks. So. The original Halo 2 lookup um, was, I think, introduced in 2021. Um, and it's the simplest to explain. Um, but since then, we have more efficient versions. But let's just see how Halo 2 used to do it, uh, or Halo 2 does it. So um, basically, given an input, you want to prove that every element in the input um, appears at least once in the table. And how you do that is you make permuted versions of both the input and the table, and you have to permute them in the following way. So for the input, you want to permute the values such that all like values um, are adjacent. Um, and so, yeah, what this means is that all like values are in arranged in these blocks. And on the table side, you want to permute it such that for the first occurrence of each unique value, um, it aligns with the same value in the table. 
And the other values in the table, I don't care. You can permute them however you want. So, um, yeah, you can see how um, if each input is either equal to the previous value or equal to the, t the corresponding table value, then this is equivalent to saying each input value appears at least once in the table. Um, so these constraints are expressed as polynomial identities. And these polynomial identities are enforced as part of the proof statement. So they're part of their relation that we're proving. Um, so this Halo 2 lookup was inefficient because, um, well, precisely because it introduced these two extra permuted columns. So for each column that you introduce, um, that actually incurs a cost for the prover. Um, they need to compute a, a, a commitment um, to this column and concretely that involves doing a lot of elliptic curve operations um, which is slow. So the um, a more efficient um, variant of the lookup is called logup um, and basically instead of introducing these extra permuted columns um, logup just uses the following identities. So it says um, if you want to show that um, every value in F, the input, appears somewhere in T, the table, then you can just check that um, this grand product um, over the elements of F is equal to the product over the elements of the table. Um, raised to this m, which is the multiplicity. So this is m is the number of times this table element appears um, in the input. So if it is true that um, every um, every input value appears at least once in the table value in the table, then these two products should be equal. So the problem here is that naively, this M could be large and this could be a high degree polynomial, um, which, which is even more expensive for the prover than um, computing those extra permutations. So in, to get around this, um, logup converts this identity into its logarithmic derivative form. Um, intuitively, it's like going from a product to a sum. And so this M here is no longer a problem. It's just the numerator in the sum end over here. Um, so the logup paper then rewrites this equality of sums as a polynomial identity. Um, and it checks this polynomial identity in a similar way that um, Halo 2 does. So now instead of introducing the, those two permutations, it just introduces this um, running sum polynomial um, and the helper polynomial. Um, that's the um, uh, that's the two summons. So um, this approach is particularly effective when you have multiple inputs to the same table um, because you can batch them um, up to a certain degree bound uh, and not have to, for, so for Halo 2, each input, even if it's to the same table, would require a different permutation um, of both the input and the table. So, Whereas um, in logup, we don't have that extra cost per input. So a recent um, improvement to logup 
actually uh, removes this polynomial identity check and um, works directly with this um, sum check. So um, it does this using a protocol called GKR. Um, and basically why this is efficient is because the prover doesn't have to commit to these helper polynomials. And the prover can work um, entirely in um, field operations instead of um, elliptic curve operations. So that's way cheaper. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's how the logarithmic derivative form of this lookup identity um, was an improvement over the original Halo 2 or lookup arguments based on permutation or reordering. So then this paper CQ cached quotients came out after that, um, that uses the same logarithmic identity, um, but in the pre-processing setting, it does um, several very aggressive um, optimizations and um, on a high level, um, these optimizations involve pre-computing and caching um, values that the prover can later on use. So, um, CQ, so yeah, CQ is optimized for the regime where your table is much, much larger um, than the number of inputs. Um, and, uh, yeah, CQ is, um, so, by the way, we've implemented um, the original Halo 2 lookup as well as logup and CQ in, in Halo 2. And um, so CQ comes with several additional requirements. So it requires the use of um, what's called a pairing, a bilinear pairing. Um, so that restricts it to only very specific curves. And also CQ requires basically a lot of storage um, for uh, the pre-computed and cached quotients. Um, the last argument we'll look at is lasso. Um, and we also have an implementation of lasso. Well, this was done by Dohun from the Ethereum Foundation. Um, so yeah, lasso, um, it uses the sum check, um, this sum check identity. Um, to, to check that um, the lookup, so this is the input A, and it's checking that A is the result of um, multiplying the lookup table T by um, some lookup indices. So the indices are basically the positions in T uh, where the input values occur. So lasso is based around this uh, some check identity. Um, and um, we don't have time to go into the details of lasso, but um, some high level things to note are um, firstly, the authors of lasso um, so optimized it to work with decomposable tables. So over here you see that um, we have this um, index i on the tables. So um, lasso works well when a large table can be broken down into many ti's. Um, and 
it might be interesting to note that internally, um, Lasso uses a primitive called offline memory checking. Um, and um, yeah, it's interesting because um, it uses the memory checking primitive in a read-only format. So whereas memory checking in general allows read-write and is actually a more powerful primitive than lookups, but they found an efficient use for the read-only memory checking algorithm um, as part of their lookup argument. So um, Lasso is also efficient because, yeah, it doesn't require the prover to make many commitments um, and uh, yeah, we'll see, we can move on to the benchmarks now, um, where we'll see that, um, so Lasso and Logup GKR are tied over here, um, as being the most efficient in terms of proving time. And this is both for the same reason is because um, they they both use the GKR protocol and um, avoid uh, having the prover commit uh, to large polynomials. Um, whereas the original Halo 2 lookup is the slowest here because the prover has to commit to many additional polynomials, the permuted versions of the input and the lookup. Um, and these two in between are variants of um, the logarithmic derivative lookup. Um, so I think I'll end off with some higher level comments on basically the role of lookups in zero knowledge arguments and why it's difficult to compare and benchmark them directly. So yeah, they are optimized for different use cases and for different contexts. Um, and so one lookup um, when benchmarked in another lookups context would underperform very likely. Um, but yeah, all of these lookups um, are basically, they have the same aim, right? Which is to make zero knowledge proofs more efficient. Um, and so this benchmark that we saw was comparing proving time. Um, for proving time, there are certain uh, metrics that really matter, like the, the number of commitments that you make, how parallelizable the algorithm is and how much of it can be moved to pre-processing. Um, there are other um, sort of benchmarks of interest, like not just proving time, but let's say proof size is a very common one. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I think the takeaway from this is that um, lookups are emerging as a very powerful primitive in zero knowledge proofs. And if you're thinking of using a lookup argument, um, you would do well to pick one that is suited for your use case. I think a lot of interesting work remains in um, comparing at a deeper level um, how these are similar and different and how some of them could possibly work with each other. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks once again for Inton's presentation. Now let's move forward to our next speaker. Our next speaker will be Prof. Li Yi from NTU CCDS. Today, Prof. Li Yi will share with us the automated invariant generation for solid state smart contracts. Let's welcome Prof. Li Yi.